markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Welcome, everyone. This is Chat with Traders episode 193. I'm your host, Aaron Fifield, and with me is Greg Newman, who previously featured on the podcast in 2018 and was recently included in the Best of Risk Management compilation episode two. Greg's a founding partner and the CEO of Onyx Commodities, a London-based proprietary trading firm that's prominent in market making of oil derivatives. Now, in line with the last couple episodes that have focused on recent events, this episode covers what's been happening in oil. More specifically, Greg goes through key events and themes driving oil prices, including the virus impact, supply and demand dynamics, why the crude and Brent futures alone aren't entirely a true reflection of the oil market, how lower prices affect producers, corporates and other large purchases of oil, etc. So given the subject matter, I know this episode won't be for everyone. It is very specific to oil. But if the energy sector does interest you, then Greg is an incredible wealth of knowledge. All links mentioned, including a link to our first interview, episode 159, are listed in the show notes at chatwithtraders.com slash 193. Lastly, this episode was recorded 2nd of April 2020, and I apologize for the sound. It's a little scratchy in some parts, but overall, not too bad. Ladies and gents, please welcome Greg Newman. I wanted to reach out to you because I know there's been a lot happening in oil as well. Um, so I'm interested to hear about sort of some of the themes which are driving oil prices, some of the dynamics that you're observing, um, and of course, how your firm's been trading around it. So I think probably a good starting point for this would be if we go back to the beginning of March. Uh, there was that, yeah, there was a major event where oil gapped down something around 30% over the weekend when it came back online Sunday evening. As a firm, how did you manage trading the evening oil gap down so much? Do you know what? If I could take it back a bit, because uh, oil free. has been very, very interesting. Yeah, but as in, we came into 2020. Uh, and actually, there's a lot going on. It's been a very interesting market in oil, particularly in the last uh, year. You know, going back, we had the Saudi Arabia tax, the uh, threat of a war with Iran, um, OPEC decisions. Um, and then actually a really big one was the International Maritime Organization. They they enforced a specification change in shipping fuel. Uh, they lowered the sulfur cap that you could have in the oil. And it had really... Uh, interesting kind of impacts on the market not i don't think anyone really expected it to have the impact it had we suddenly had this fuel that was pricing you know an end user product that was pricing way above anything else and it was changing the way people were buying certain crudes and certain different behaviors and actually the way you looked at the market was suddenly very very different so it was a really interesting time but ultimately you know coming into 2020 we the trade houses and the majors and these guys with you know, big derivative yeah. purchasing power in the market. The guys do a lot of trades. They've done very, very well. And I think there was an element of coming into this year with a lot of confidence. And there was talk more of oversupply in the crude market, even in uh, early 2020. And certainly at Onyx, we, we had that kind of view longer term. So you were starting to see the signs, but you did have this kind of these dynamics at play that were making things interesting. But I think when the coronavirus started to be taken more seriously, because, you know, we did hear it being talked as early as December and then January, it was on the focus for the oil market because um, in China, the Chinese are a huge buyer of oil and oil products. And it's really important to keep an eye on what China, the Chinese are, are doing. And because they were very impacted uh, and the Eastern market in general was starting to get impact early on in the year, you were starting to see the signs of, of corona on the oil market Um uh, in the early early parts of the year. But I think like anyone else, like anyone sitting at home or, or looking at things this year, it, immediately it, was, it was, didn't seem like a global pandemic at the time. It didn't seem, there wasn't any certainty that this was going to become what it's become. And of course, what naturally happens is that filters through into your psychology for your decision-making, if you're a trader. And I think these guys that came in, a lot of them 
quite confident on the long side uh, in general, uh, done very well last year. I think they were to an element of denial, right? an element of this is probably not going to last. And it steadily became you know, worse and worse. But then, yes, this pricing war situation happened, which has become you know, really uh, talked about across the world. And bang in the middle of this, we had um, the OPEC, uh, OPEC plus, meaning um, Russia and the uh, OPEC um, conglomerate. And ultimately, uh, there were discussions about what they were going to do about the coronavirus, a clear demand slump when uh, they wanted to cut production even more. But the thing is, is that these guys have been cutting production for quite a long time. That was only ever meant to be a temporary thing. I think only 18 months initially. And they've been rolling these cuts you know, every six months again and again and again. And Russia were never really that keen about this. You know, they did it reluctantly from, from what they were saying and, and, and what was being read. Um, so I think it was just a matter of, look, we don't want to cut even more. I thought, yes, we can roll these cuts, but to cut even more is just not something they were prepared to do. And Saudi Arabia in particular saw this as, well, you know, we need to either be protecting the oil price, protecting the supply that's going in the market or getting market share. And so they came out and said, right, if, you, if we're not going to comply, then we're not going to let anyone else uh, produce more than us. So we're going to produce as much as we can and then go for market share. So that's what's happened. But the really interesting thing, I think, yes, in combination, uh, you had the demand destruction from coronavirus, but then combined with the pricing war, you know, it was really clear that the market needed to go lower. And I think anyone really with oil market, looking at the oil market, you didn't need to have a huge amount of industry knowledge to know that this was going to be really impactful on the downside. So it was the fact that it was released on the weekend that was very, very interesting because if you go back to last year with the Saudi Arabia attacks uh, from allegedly like, Iranian missiles, that took off 10 million barrels of production, just straight off the market, real oil not being able to be delivered. And that, again, is very binary up. You know, it's, it's very binary, a bullish thing for the market. And it happened over the weekend. So usually what happens in markets, and it's very common across all markets that are financially traded, you have a situation where something happens and then you need to react or you need to do something if you have risk on either you want to trade it to to try and uh, through a strategy or you want to get out of your current risk but either way there's going to be a herd type panic type situation and the common phrase as i'm sure a lot of people have heard is you know, buy the rumor sell the fact and what that essentially means is you know, when it's happening right now and you don't know what's going on there's an, there's a good uh, kind of strategy to profit from the kind of hysteria and contagion of fear to you know buy into it and, and ride it up and then once the news actually comes out be aggressive in in getting out and it could be the reverse way it doesn't have to always be up and down but it could be down and up but either way that's um, usually what happens when this information is fed through during during the day and when the markets are open but the markets and the oil markets are the the derivatives uh, in oil aren't traded over the weekend so. You had a situation last year that uh, on a Saturday, this, these missiles hit and then everyone had time to actually consolidate and think, what, is this act what does this actually mean for oil? And no matter where you spun it, it was not a rumor situation. It was genuine production offline and there's going to be a genuine impact to oil. So when you came in on the Sunday evening when the markets open, so it's 10 p.m. UK time, it's going to be so obvious that the market's going to go up. So what, that, what happens and the why dynamics now come into play is that when the exchange opens they match all the orders that have been put on as pre-orders so you can go in and say i want to buy oil uh, you can say at market right you might even put your price in i want to buy up to this level and then you have the other side which is the sell orders and the exchange will just match them and the market will open to where these orders are satisfied themselves but on that time you had you know, mostly buying, of course, because it was so it was so clear what was going to happen. And anyone who was long wasn't going to sell them. They were going to wait because why, why would you not? It's so clear what's going to happen. So the market just gapped up ten dollars. And that's a huge thing to do. Ten dollar just in a, in a microsecond. And then from there, you have panic and, and, and all that kind of thing. And then it took some time to settle down. So I think there's an element of strategy there. I think you can never prove these things, of course, but in my mind, it was a very strategic thing to do to release this news uh, on the weekend. So you already had a demand slump. You already had a quite a long market, as I was saying before. So you went, went into this weekend, the market long, demand starting to, to peter out from Corona, and then releasing all this supply on the market or the news that you're going to release on the supply on the market 
the sell orders bef- on the weekends just you know were flooded the exchange and we gapped down as you said 30 percent in a split second and why was that so important this time well as i said i i believe the market was generally very long or, or at least quite long and so again if you have this happening during the day you have time to get out of it you can even get short if you if you're quick enough and you're efficient enough quite hard to do if you're a big player but this time it just gapped down so yes the outright price gapped down 30 percent, but so did all the differentials all the time spreads all the components of oil and the oil derivative ecosystem would just gap down and there was no room for anyone to trade out of it you were either short and participating in the move down or you were long and getting hurt and then what do you do when you come in on monday morning so right we're, we're down a lot of money we, or our positions against us but the market's moved down so much it's not an obvious thing to then sell again see what i mean so it was very difficult time and it hasn't closed it hasn't sorry it hasn't um even down the market activity has been crazy the price action has been crazy ever since uh because you've got to look at it from a trader's perspective you know it's, it's actually still early on in the year we've got to make we've got to we've got to uh get our revenues for the year and if we're down we want a chance to fight back so what do we do from here so there's a lot of a lot of things going on there's people trying to um capture the difference between the prompt price and the forward prices uh, by cash and carry. So what is that? It's buying a, uh, buying a ship and filling up the ship with oil right now, storing it out in the ocean and waiting for the prices to recover. There's people doing that. So there's derivative flow from that. There's derivative flow from speculators getting short. There's uh, buyers who uh, you know, are end users uh, who want to profit from, or want to at least capture the low prices to allow their businesses to run. So there's, there's, there's a huge amount going on, huge amount of volatility, and it's really, really very interesting. But for us, um, the initial uh, worry was not the price action itself, because we are trading the granular swaps and differentials. And as I say, the ecosystem around oil, that's more related to the physical and the flows and geographical locations, all these things going on. Uh, that's where we're trading, and, and that's the swap market in general. And that has been... You know, really good market conditions. We like volatility. We're there to provide liquidity. We're, we're market makers. So someone wants a price. People are very willing to do it and not negotiate because it's a fast moving market. So a lot of the work is being done for us in that respect. But our initial concern was, well, God, this is really serious on a global economy side of things. And operationally, are the exchanges going to be OK? Is the clearing bank going to be OK? How's the financial system globally going to react to this? Um, and so hats off to, to the regulators at the end of the day, because I think the banks are a lot more prepared this time compared with the 08 crisis, or certainly the 08 crisis. But since then, there have been issues, and it's been very hard for banks to get dollar liquidity. And I'd actually love to listen to that podcast that you said you, you, you had um, with that trader on, on the kind of Fed movements, etc. But that was our initial concern, that the functionality of the market, the trading access would, would go down. But actually, the exchanges have had loads of contingency they're all okay. The clearing banks are okay. And actually, everything's operating as normal. So it's more about getting operationally sorted from our point of view. And as we were talking about before, Aaron, it's um, just been a matter of our tech team and operations team making sure there's trading stations for everyone at home and the internet connection is good, the remote server is good. And, and they've been absolute heroes for us. And they've really mad- allowed us to be in the game and, and profit from, from all this uh, violent price action and market conditions. So, yes, it, that's been good for us. I think, generally speaking, the, the market will continue to function, uh, which, as I say, hats off to regulators and, and banks and exchanges all kind of prepare to this uh, to some degree. So what, what exposure did you have going into the weekend? I know I understand you're a market maker and I understand that you're also trading not only the futures derivatives, but you're trading the swaps, which are more closely tied to the actual physical, etc. What sort of exposure did you have, regardless, going into the weekend? So what we'll inevitably have is residual risk left over from taking the market flows across all the products and across all the crudes. Uh, there's many, many different differentials in each region. So there's, there's you know, products can vary based on specification, based on region. Uh, based on product, and what happens if you if we're trading all those together as a as a company, uh, it, you, can, you can never really get flat. So what we're left over with is a lot of time spreads, 
a lot of um, cross product differentials um, and what we call boxed up risk. You know, so essentially trying to keep our delta as close to zero as possible. And so what we're exposed to is just just the difference between the prompt prices and the forward prices. Uh, and as, as I say, cross product prices, and that tends to move less and tends to be more manageable and tends to be more flow driven. So we might even actually hold that risk purposely to preposition for the next time zone. So if it's in Singapore, for instance, uh, there's Eastern flows um, in, in the Singapore based market and they behave very differently and have different requirements to the European. So if you know that uh, and you trade the US market, for instance, in the evening, you can position yourself into flows or into contracts that will assist you in market making the next morning. And so that that would be the majority of the risk we had going in. And to some degree, there's some speculative positions also. You know, to, and If you're going to preempt where liquidity is going to be required, there is an element of speculation to that. So coming in, we certainly had that kind of risk on the books. But ultimately... It's, it's a very low proportion relative to our intraday trading. And so it's managed in such a way that even in, in huge moves, we're not expecting to draw down considerably. Uh, and actually, we, we want to be in these, we want to be trading and able to react to the, these situations because this is when the market needs liquidity most. And this is where there's really our, our function and service providing to the market comes into fruition. This is really where, where, we're, where we're wanted and, and needed by the market. So as long as we can go in clean enough in our books and not too much damage on a drawdown basis, we're there to to function. And it's, it's just been very, very, very busy. Does it make it difficult for you to make a market during events like this? Because as you kind of described earlier, it's like this was very clearly a sell sign. Everyone was trying to sell. I mean, is it hard for you to make a market in that condition where a lot of the flow is very one-sided? I understand that might be a bit of a naive question, but uh, I'm interested to hear your answer. Sure. So again, it comes back to the outright price or not. So if you want, it was very clear from an outright price perspective and outright differentials. You know, if you've got if you've got a market that a crude differential or a product differential, it has its different dynamics. It's, it's actually more straightforward for a crude differential because you know that the crude market is being oversupplied. The refiners don't want the crude because they can't make any money. There's demand destruction. So you'd sell the outright price if you wanted to trade the outright price. And you might sell the swap differential to the outright price as well. But on the flip side, when you have a product differential, or, or to be fair, a certain type of crude differential as well, it's a relative value thing. It's not going to move like for like with the outright price. So actually, there's scenarios where, for instance, if I look at, say, the uh, residual fuel oil market, which is the... Um, bunker fuel or now is used uh, into the blending pool and sometimes for to run into refiners directly. So you've got this market, which actually is decorrelated. It's, it's inversely correlated, sorry, to Brent futures. So if Brent futures go down, the differential goes up. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, the first one just being that's just market dynamics. If, if, if enough people buy into that style, then that it does tend to be what happens. And when that uh, correlation breaks down, uh, then that's a sign that something's changing, that kind of thing. But ultimately, it comes down to, or it could come down to, an end user needs to buy, for instance. So they want to buy a product, a derivative, uh, let's say an airline, they want to buy jet. So they're going to buy the jet fuel outright price. And they're not so worried about the jet differential to the Brent futures. They just want to buy the jet. So if they're in there buying and there's a lot of flow buying there, but there's a huge amount of flow selling from the brand futures, then you will naturally see that jet fuel differential to brand future widen and actually go up, not down. So that's an example of how it's in the swaps and diffs and time spreads. It's not linear. It's not completely correlated to the outright price moves. And if you take that one step further, if I again use jet fuel as an example, the difference between jet and Europe and Singapore will not be correlated to Brent futures at all as well. It will be more dependent on the shipping costs because it's it's pricing in the differential or pricing in the economics of moving jet fuel from one region to another. And you can go again and again, the difference between a jet specification in one area to another, in Northwest Europe to Mediterranean, it, it just it, it gets more and more granular the more you look at the products and the different types of crudes. So that's where we're sitting. And again, 
uh, that's just the products themselves, but actually the time structures. So if we're trading in the forward curve, we're trading you know as far as two years out, it's going to be very different or not correlated at least to Brent futures. There's going to be different people doing different things. There might be people buying the time spreads because they need to lock in this cash and carry, this uh, storage play I told you about. Um, there might be an end user, there might be a utility who wants to buy in a very specific area. And all the flows will move around depending on that. And ultimately, everything is linked. And that, that therein lies the skill of a market maker. They're trying to bring flows from different areas, from a different products to provide liquidity in different areas. But if you avoid the outright price, there's still a huge amount to do. And as I say, not correlated with the, with the price of oil uh, outright on an outright basis at all. Does that, does that answer your question? It does, yeah. I understand how you're spreading your risk across uh, different uh, contract expiries and different products, etc. I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell, yeah? Well, it is, but it's also the fact that it's not about just, okay, yes, the oil price is going to go down and generally the prices for all oil and oil product is going to go down, but the differentials within that and the different time regions, they're not going to move on that basis. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That that's that's the crux of it, and there's, that's why I say there's a lot of there's a lot of need for people to lock in these these differentials. You might you might be a buyer of uh, jet fuel or say fuel oil in Europe, and you want to bring it to Singapore, and you're always doing that. Therefore, you need to buy the difference between the two contracts. Uh, and so there's loads of these different types of trades and strategies and hedging to be done. So there's all these different types of price movements that aren't correlated to the oil price. That, that's essentially what I'm trying to say. Okay. I might just ask you to explain the terminology for the word uh, differentials. Sure. Um, I think there might be a few people who get uh, caught up on that. Okay. So a differential, what I mean there is, is, again, focusing on the swaps. So everything needs a benchmark, right? Everything is traded relative to a benchmark. So you have the Brent futures as an example. And then you can then determine the Brent swaps from the Brent futures. And the Brent swaps, you will trade differentials to that. So, so a, uh, for example, let's say uh, dated Brent. So dated Brent is the North Sea, is representative of the North Sea crude oil market. And that will uh, have a price. And that price difference between the actual underlying North Sea oil versus the Brent swap is, is what we call a differential. And then you can do that with many, many products. So for instance, you could say, yeah, as I said, the jet fuel in Northwest Europe, that will be a differential to Brent swap as well. You could have a differential to uh, jet fuel to gas oil. And it, what it essentially means is the stable interactions that the physical guys use and the derivative players use to trade, to trade around. So there'll be liquidity in these key diffs and that's where you need to focus to get your liquidity. So, for an example, if you're a, if you're a Mediterranean uh, jet fuel buyer, you'll actually focus on the jet Northwest Europe differential to Brent swap because that's where the liquidity is. And then you'll then manage your Mediterranean versus Northwest Europe exposure. So it's all about essentially the contracts that link the contracts. That's what a differential is. It gets very granular, but that's the way we describe it. And, and, and the differentials will reflect the what's going on in the regions. So for instance, again, that dated Brent example, if you know, Brent swaps are a function of the Brent futures and a lot's going on in the Brent futures, a lot of speculation, et cetera, but then the dated Brent differential to that will be more reflective of the underlying physical. So if it's very weak, it's showing you that the prices for the benchmark are too high for the physical, physical players to actually commit to. They're only willing to commit to a lower price. So that's essentially telling you the information that it's weak uh, in, the, in, the, in the market. And that is how we generally look at markets, even if we want to know what's happening with the outright market. We want to know what are the differentials doing, because that's the real signals of what the physical market is doing. Uh, and actually, it, it, it's, it's re very, very relevant, that kind of um, analysis right now. So remember last year, we talked about um, trading what you're trading remember that mm -hmm. and what that essentially meant what i was trying to say there was be careful about your expression or your view and how you're expressing it so right now it's very interesting because brent futures as an example are have been very weak since the move down uh, on that weekend a few weeks ago that we talked about but actually 
since then, it's been very difficult to break below $25 per barrel. And that doesn't really make much sense in a supply and demand basis. But this is the key thing. The futures aren't a reflection of supply and demand. They're just one price. The physical oil prices, i.e. the differentials, the physical oil prices that are traded at differentials of the benchmark are all very, very, very weak. And they're reflecting the true price of physical oil, and they can continue to move down. But the Brent futures market can stay where it is uh, because it's only one derivative. And I think this is generally not really understood too well, which is that if in order for Brent futures to reflect supply and demand, it would need to perfectly mimic the physical market. So what that means in a kind of overarching sense is the only way for Brent futures to reflect supply and demand uh, dynamics of global crude production would be if every single producer of crude oil sold the Brent future as a way to hedge their production. And conversely, only if all the consumers hedge 100% of their consumption with Brent futures. And then any difference between the two would then indicate a supply and demand difference. But of course, we know that doesn't happen. One, the global producers of crude and consumers of crude, they don't 100% hedge. I mean, that's for sure. There's a lot of governments that's just too big. They don't, they don't even bother hedging. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that those who are hedging, they're not going to use Brent futures exclusively. In fact, very rarely are they going to use just the, the Brent futures because it's not reflective of their actual physical. They'll buy a swap or sell a swap um, in their particular region. So they might do data Brent if they're North Sea or European crude. They might do Dubai uh, swaps if they're Middle Eastern because it's much more reflective. So there's no way that you could justify that Brent futures are reflective of supply demand basis just purely on a hedging point of view because they don't balance out. But on top of that, the volumes that trade in the Brent futures market are many, many times the underlying global crude production. So actually, what makes up the majority of the market is speculation and buying and selling derivative power from trade houses, majors, hedge funds, macro players, foreign exchange traders. So this, that's what moves the, the Brent futures market in particular. So it's quite confusing for people when they say, well, why is Brent Futures still doing this when markets are so weak and all the physical prices are so weak? And yes, the first clue that the market is weak is that all these differentials that we're talking about are very low. But it's not a great reflection to say, or it's not a great way to express your bearish view by selling Brent Futures at the moment. Why? Because everyone who is participating uh, since that weekend, it's been such a clear thing that it's a sell, that you've got a situation where the market is heavily saturated short. And if the market's heavily saturated short, then there's no one really left to sell in decent volume. And so all you're left with are opportunistic buyers. So end users who want to buy to uh, capture the low prices like airlines and shippers, etc. Or you might have guys who want to short cover their short positions. And the way to know and get signals that this is going on is to see the reaction to headlines and, and physical information. So for an example, just uh, yesterday, we had the Department of Energy and the US release their statistics for their crude stocks, and it was expected at 4 million barrels. And you could argue that these things are never really that accurate. But ultimately, I, I would, you would say that the, the realms of possibility should be 1 or 2 million barrels around that number. And actually came in at 13 or more than 13 million barrels stock build. And that is incredibly bearish or more bearish information. And the market went down 25 cents and then recovered by the end of the day and actually went up on the end of the day. And that's not really surprising if you know that the market, A, is very short already. Uh, B, this kind of physical information is probably already priced in. And so it makes it very difficult, very frustrating for those trying to reflect a bearish view of oil with the Brent futures price. However, if you trade with a differential like we're talking about or a time spread, there's actually a very high chance that this is going to, to trade with supply and demand fundamentals. And the reason being is because the swaps that ultimately price out um, and are valued to physical oil, a real proportion of physical oil, depending on what, what the swap contract specifications are, you can't fight the supply and demand. It will price where the physical prices are trading. And so no matter how much you buy, if you wanted to push up the market, it doesn't matter because it's going to settle to where the physical is. And that makes it a lot less able to be to be pushed around by speculation. And, you know, you hear um, guys on CNBC and uh, generally people talking about the macro market saying the oil market is manipulated and this and that. But what they mean is the oil market doesn't move like for like for what's going on in oil. But as financial traders, and this is the same for any market, 
You need to understand market psychology as much, if not more, than the underlying supply and demand because you've got to know the participants who are trading and the, 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 the traders that are able to influence the price by their buying and selling volume. What are they doing? And it's completely clear that everyone's short. So I think it's, it's quite worrying for, uh, I think traders should be careful speculating on the outright price right now. They should be doing it with um, an expression that really does marry what they're trying to express versus what they're expressing. So this trade, what you're trading thing I, I talked about last time, it's still very, very, very important. Um, and, and another example is, is the US crude. You can trade on a retail basis. So a lot of people can get access to the WTI the US crude futures. But that's even more uh, dynamics at play because um, you have US flows, yes, but actually the, it's reflecting the oil of Cushing. So actually Oklahoma, which is 500 miles away from uh, the waterborne or able to export that oil uh, to the open market through ships. So you've got all these pipeline dynamics to be aware of and those hedging their pipeline dynamics, uh, arbitrages, and there's, there's just so much going on. Um, that you need to be aware of all the factors and know what you're expressing. If you sell WTI futures, you need to be aware, or buy WTI futures, you need to be aware of not just who's participating and why, but where it's the underlying basis and, and the dynamics, the physical dynamics at play, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's just to reiterate that point, really, but it all comes together with this, what you originally asked, which what differential actually is. And it's essentially the reality of the of the physical oil market, the prices that need to benchmark against something, because it's not useful to say if you're in you know in West Africa or, or somewhere not close to uh, oil hubs like um, like Data Brent uh, or like Cushing and in, in WTI, it's it's very difficult for you to say right, let's agree on an outright oil price, because where are you going to come up with that number? It's it's much more and much more straightforward to reference a benchmark price like WTI futures, like red futures. And then you will then determine value of your oil depending on the difference in the regions and how you value that difference in the regions and how you difference the value in the specification. So the West African example, there's a West African crew producer. They will look at the what, what the data bread market is doing, what the bread futures market is doing. And they say, well, we think our oil is slightly different to that market and we're going to value that at plus one dollar because we think it's a better quality we we'll also know that it takes uh, a fair amount of time to to bring the oil over you need freight costs etc so we're going to incorporate that into the price as well and it's much easier to negotiate the price basis of benchmark than it is an outright basis so that's why they're so popular and used so much but consequently because they're the ones these differentials are actually the reflective of the prices that have been negotiated in the physical market, it's therefore much more reflective of what's really going on in the underlying physical. And I actually talked about it this morning, uh, did a post on LinkedIn about how, yes, a lot of people are talking about how the US oil prices are very low, the actual physical oil prices for shale, et cetera, are very low, uh, and therefore there's going to be production cuts. Um, okay, that's but that's a very, that's, you know, quite a myopic view. That's, that's just, that's, Anyone can kind of see that, but then what's next? Well, if you've hedged and you've hedged correctly, i.e. with the actual swap that's reflective of your physical, then that's the whole point of hedging. You can keep operating because uh, you've locked in the cash flows, right? You've sold what your, your forward production and yes, you're producing and, and uh, making a lot less money than you were on your physical, but that's been offset by your derivative hedge. So that keeps them in the game for longer. Uh, and there's those kind of dynamics at play. So you need to say, okay, well, how, how do I actually get evidence for that these producers in the US are slowing down? And again, the swaps market will tell you that. So the LinkedIn post this morning was essentially saying, right, the last two days, we've seen the US grade, we call it US grade domestic crude market. So it's, it's, it's the differentials in the US market to WTI futures. And those differentials, and they, you know, they're the Gulf Coast, um, different specifications in the Gulf Coast, in, in Houston, uh, in Cushing, in the Midlands. And so you, you look at all these differentials and they're all correlated. At the moment. They're all uh, strengthening. And that is a great signal that you don't need to know who's doing what. You just know there's a lot of flow, flow pointing upwards, which suggests and the evidence suggests that there is that there is genuinely production cuts. And because it's traded in the future, because these differentials, a lot of them are traded forward, forward looking. It's actually reflective of decisions being made. So traders are clearly anticipating that the U.S. oil production is going to go down and therefore the prices should recover. 
So they're reflecting that in, say, one or two or three months forward in the swaps market because they're preempting it. So you don't need to know what, which specific trader is doing that to know that well, if everyone's doing it, there's clearly something going on that I don't know, which makes sense because I'm not a physical player. I don't have share level production, but I'm seeing these, this market react that way. That is the evidence you need to know that, yes, production really is slowing right now in the US. And there's a case to be said that perhaps um, something's going on even deeper, that, that there could be agreements being taking place. You just don't know. But what you can do is marry what's actually happening in the physical market through the information and swaps and then start to express it how you want. Does that make sense? And that, that's why differentials are so important. There you've been speaking uh, about the actual oil producers themselves. I'd be interested to know or hear you talk about what impacts the drop in the price of oil, how that's impacted other industries, for example, maybe airliners and other companies which are major purchases of oil. So with companies, it's actually typically what we call them corporates. You know, they're not oil traders. They just have uh, requirements to purchase oil and oil products to run their business, as you say, for instance, an airline. And typically when you get the price of oil lower, it's, it's great for them. It's a, it's a windfall, you know, that they're, they're able to uh, either just buy cheaper jet fuel uh, right now in the prompt, or they're able to then look at the swaps market, the forward market, and say, right, here's the levels that we're going to be able to buy jet fuel in the future if we hedge right now. Let's do it. And that allows us to plan, you know, in, the, in one, two, three years forward. And it's great. So they can, they can know their economics and they're ultimately going to make a lot more money if they've got lower, lower costs. The problem is this time is that it's also coupled with a demand destruction from the coronavirus and planes being grounded and airlines going bust. And it's a shame because the way it typically works is you have a hedge. Um, so if you haven't hedged, then the airlines will be able to buy cheaper jet fuel. But also, if they have hedged uh, in the past, then they'll actually be losing money on that hedge, which should be offset or should be mimicked with the uh, physical jet fuel they're buying, which is then cheaper. So they're losing money on the hedge, but buying cheaper physical oil. So net on net, they're, they're just kind of flat, depending on how much they've hedged. That's typically what happens. But this time, they ha aren't getting the ticket sales. There's not been an increase in ticket sales. And there's just been a complete demand destruction. So not only are they losing money on their hedge and have a negative mark to market on that, they also don't have uh, any ticket sales to then justify buying physical jet fuel at a lower price. So they're just losing money on, on lack of ticket sales and they're losing money on the negative mark to market on the hedges. And the reason why that's so important is because, uh, you know, they might be able to withstand the the negative, negative cash flow, but it's the fact that they need to actually fund that cash. In these extreme scenarios, banks aren't willing to leave the credit lines open without some kind of funds. So they now are needing to transfer real cash over, which is very much needed uh, right now to, to stay solvent. They're needing to, as per agreement, transfer this cash over to the banks, to the credit lines, uh, or the exchanges, depending on how they've uh, traded. And they're losing twice. They're bleeding their cash. They're not able to profit from the low prices, and they're losing money on their, on, on their hedges. So it's, it's a very, very difficult time for uh, airlines at the moment. That said, uh, if they can consolidate, unwind their hedges, bleed the cash, um, so stop the bleed in the, in the, in the cash flow um, and kind of minimize operations and consolidate, they can actually look forward. And, and if you think you're going to be flying in the future, which you would expect, you know, as we talked about just before, Aaron, you know, maybe six months is what means quoted for things back to normal. Whatever it ends up being, you, you've got to have some kind of opinion on what you're going to be able to do in the next year, two, three years. And with oil prices this low, it's still a good idea, a very good idea for oil um, end users like jet, uh, like uh, airlines who need to buy jet fuel to forward hedge right now and lock in these prices at this low level. Because if they do that, as and when we come out of this situation, uh, you might get a big recovery in oil. There might have been an agreement made with OPEC at that time. And you, and you would have been able to lock in these historically very low prices, which you know are very... Uh, appealing on a uh, historical basis relative to your costs. Uh, the oil price of oil is hugely, fluctuates hugely, and it can be the difference between uh, you know doing well in an airline or doing badly. So I would still, we, um, we have a consultancy arm now in Onyx, and we're definitely pushing for airlines to consider this. 
and at least try and hedge something in the forward production. Albeit, yes, not right now because we don't. There's so much uncertainty. But you would expect in the next year or two to be able to get going again. And the prices are still low for the next year or two. Uh, and and that's what's going. And that's the same for shipping companies. Um, you know, road freight. Anyone buying any oil product is is it's exactly the same. Um, but again, the the on the flip side, the producers. So. Uh, those wanting to trade equities in, um, you know, U.S. oil companies, it's actually really important in these times to look at their hedging. And I think it, the public companies they'll make that uh, public, so you can know the percentage of their production that they've always hedged. And a lot of these uh, shale oil producers, they actually only get they only get lent money from banks if they have committed to a hedging program to lock in their uh, forward oil prices. So if you look at that and you can see that they're quite well hedged and they've got some decent cash flow, then they're well positioned to at least sustain for a, for a short period while this goes on. And if and when, as and when price recovers do, uh, sorry, price oil prices do recover, they'll be in a strong position to, to maintain solvency. So the ones you want to look at are the ones that didn't hedge. If you're, if you're looking at companies that are going to continue to go lower, you'd want to look at the companies that didn't hedge, have no protection on these low prices, uh, and of course, a lot of debt, et cetera. The only other thing I'd say on, on, on the company basis is, is the refiners, um, those actually refining the oil. Again, typically, uh, refiners will do quite well in low oil price environments because it generally, um, in the historically, uh, has been, sorry, in the last five or so years, the sell-offs have been led by an oversupply of crude. And if it's an oversupply of crude rather than a demand destruction, then that means you can buy crude, you know, cheap prices. And if you're strategic about it and, and you have access to the world's uh, different oils, then you can increase your refinery margin, the amount you're selling your refined products for versus the the, the amount that you're, you're buying the crude for. And generally, that's quite good for refiners. But as I say, this time, it's actually been led by both a supply increase and a demand decrease. So if you're going to look forward, you need to be tracking these refinery margins. So uh, if we do get a return of demand, we still have a crude oversupply at the moment. So in order to figure out what's how the oil market's going to move forward. What I expect to, to see is you will know when the demand's returning in the oil market by the refinery margin. So you'll see that refiners are starting to generate profits. And then when that's the case, then there'll be more demand for certain crudes. And then you can start to piece, the, piece things together that way. And certainly if you're looking at a company who is just a refiner on an equity basis, then once the demand returns, they're actually going to do very, very well. Uh, in 2014, when we had the big sell-off last time, and 2015, they had an absolutely amazing year of finance. The, the, the refinery margin, despite the oil market on a crude supply basis being very low, they did very well in terms of capturing the, the value in between. Uh, so that's something to look out for. And I know, again, it's coming back to how do you access that uh, if you don't have all the swap market information? Well, that's what we're trying to do at Onyx. We're trying to provide more transparency what we're hoping to release in the next uh, two to three weeks is uh, the oil, sorry, the Onyx price hub, um, whereby we're going to provide live prices for refinery margins, for jet fuel, uh, and these differentials we're talking about, so people can get more transparency and clarity into what's actually going on in the oil market. I think it'd be very useful, particularly those who don't typically have access, because it's a very difficult thing and sophisticated thing to, to have access to at the moment. Uh, so that could be really interesting. But what I would advise anyone speculating on oil uh, futures uh, in particular is to track the refinery margins and the differentials as best you can. But as I say, I hope to have that um, website up and, and I'll give you the details so you can you can release them if it's easier. Yeah, for sure. I'll make sure there's a link to that in the show notes. And by the time this episode comes out, there's a good chance that if it's two to three weeks, that'll be available now for anyone who's listening. Another way to uh, track that would be our, through our LinkedIn. We have a, our Onyx group. Uh, we have our trading arm, Onyx Commodities and Onyx Capital Advisors, our advising arm. We're releasing information all the time. So if you track that on LinkedIn, there will definitely be information once that's released of how to access those prices. Uh, okay, cool, cool. Greg, I was going to ask you just to wrap things up here. What are the key fundamentals which we would need to come into play to drive oil prices higher again and to recover. I think you mostly answered that already uh, towards the end of that last question, but I might just ask you again just to uh, take us out here. Yeah, sure. So 
think the first thing to to note is that uh, the futures prices again, um, and even the swaps to some degree, they're trading on forward physical prices. So there's always an element of thinking, even if the, what I'm trading is related closely to physical, the traders who are trading those contracts, they still have to have a interpretation of or or an opinion on what that physical oil in, in the future is going to do, even if it's only one to two months forward. So that's why things can change very abruptly because you might not know exactly what's going to happen, but you might have a fear as a physical physical trader that things are going to turn around and it can happen, you know, really very, very quickly within the space of a few days. So you might want to protect yourself or you might want to preempt what's going on and knowing that everyone's short, if you know there's going to be a deal made or some kind of change to the physical market, then you're going to react very quickly to it. So what we're going to need to see um, is either a deal made um, in the OPEC and Russia, and actually the US are allegedly getting involved in those discussions now. We need to see a deal made there because that will give confidence in speculators on the forward price. We need to see uh, essentially some confidence returning for for speculative buyers. And I, th I think that's really important because, as I say, the speculative market drives uh, Brent futures so much because there could still be a situation that even though we do get a retracement in the old in the Brent futures prices, the differentials may stay weak because the phys doesn't just because a deal has been made or just because there's been something happens uh, in discussions doesn't change the fact that the market's heavily oversupplied and we're completely full globally of storage. It doesn't change that. So what, what you might get is everyone looking forward will be trading the outright price and they will speculatively buy that and that will drive prices higher. But then the differentials will still remain low and you need to be careful because the market may get overexcited and overextend on the long side, whereas the physical market's still lagging. And again, you can get that signal from the time spreads and the differentials. And so then you would see probably a retracement or at least some volatility at that point. But to get a true underlying physical recovery, I'd say if and when a, a deal is made to taper this kind of considerable oversupply in crude, that will then allow some at least some storage to slowly be um, unwound. Uh, and when the market's you know full of storage uh, and full of supply, at some point it gets to the point where no one's left to buy the buy the uh, buy physical oil. So if you stop this, you know, real attempt to just pile the market full of oil, then that will at least slow that happening and may start to release some oil out of storage. But as I said, once the demand returns, which you'll see in the refinery margins, that will be when the demand destruction that we've had, which is some, I think Trafigura said recently, they reckon it's 30 million barrels in March. Um, Vital said 20 million about a few weeks ago. Either way, you're going to get that returning to the market. So you're going to get, and you, again, you'll, you'll see that in the refinery margin turning positive. It's negative at the moment, so the refiners can make money. So they're going to go out and buy the crude. So you'll have a deal made which stops there being oversupply uh, or, or serious oversupply. And you have refiners willing to buy more of the crude. And that should start to tip the market in balance. And the first thing, uh, or sorry, the most important thing I will always say is you can't look at it like, okay, so this is what the state of the oil market is right now. Therefore, I'm going to trade it. It's always forward looking. What do people think is going to happen in the next two to three months? If you're thinking like that, you'll, you, it will then make sense when the market moves ahead of you. So you might say, well, yes, I'm aware that refining margins are strong. A deal has been made, but the physical market is still really weak. Yes, but everyone's preempting the prices in the future. And that's what's going to drive a futures market. It's a lot on speculation. So you've got to be really careful. And it goes back again to how you express your view. If you want to express it in a certain way, and you need to choose the right contract and choose the right expression, uh, which you can do uh, with oil. So I think in a nutshell, that's what needs to happen. Confidence returning, deals being made, and real refinery margin increases. Okay. Well, Greg, it's been awesome to catch up with you. Man, you're just an absolute wealth of knowledge uh, when it comes to all things oil and energy. So I appreciate you coming on again and, and sharing it with us and going into such great detail on these subjects. Uh, I think it's going to help a lot of people who... Uh, have a, an interest in this sector for sure. Absolutely. No, happy to come back anytime, Aaron. It's great. And if someone does want to find out more about yourself or Onyx, where is the best place to go right now? I think we're utilizing LinkedIn quite a bit right now. We've got um, our advisory team active on it daily and myself as well. I'm releasing videos and my thoughts on market dynamics. Uh, so if you just Greg Newman on LinkedIn, uh, or follow one of our companies that the Onyx Capital Group, Onyx Commodities, Onyx Capital Advisory. There's lots going on there. 
we're releasing what we're our, our opinions, what's going on, but also, um, as I said, uh, links to the price hub that we want uh, to provide transparency and things like that. We're, we're, we're really trying to provide a platform for all derivatives to increase the accuracy relative to physical, increase the transparency for guys to know more about what's going on and ultimately liquidity. That's what we do. So we're trying to grow that out and, and, and you'll see more and more of that as we go forward. And as I say, LinkedIn is the best way. We have a website as well, but I think LinkedIn is probably easier for everyone these days. Okay. And I will also mention you do have a podcast or Onyx has a podcast. I think you started it last year and there's been a couple episodes come out this year. Is that something you're still actively doing? Definitely. I mean, it's been very, very busy and ultimately we don't have any dedicated, the people that do it are you know, the people that work day in, day out. So we do try to, to get it when we can. Obviously, time's being very busy. It's been difficult to release one recently, but certainly uh, we will we'll continue to do that. Absolutely. And what we're really enjoying with that is, yes, our opinion on how things move and what goes on, our philosophies in the market, et cetera, but also actually what it's like to be a trader or what it's like to be uh, anything at Onyx. So we even had an HR uh, our H- head of HR was talking um, not so long ago about how, how it is to work at Onyx there. And uh, so, yeah, th- th- there should be lots on that podcast for everyone, anyone interested in, in a career in finance in general. It could be quite interesting. Yeah. And it's available pretty much on all podcasting platforms. Spotify and Apple. Okay. Well, they're the two main ones. Yeah. Excellent. All right, Greg, let's leave it there uh, and we'll catch up again soon. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Sam. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.